philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles and recognize the angels that walk among us. William Wordsworth was born in Cumberland and lost both of his parents before his 14th birthday, a tragedy that may have contributed to the dark side of his personality. Dark side or not, Wordsworth would become one of the first great English romantic poets. He spent a year in France as a supporter of the revolution, then returned to England where he collaborated with Samuel Coleridge on Lyrical Ballads, a Book of Poetry. Wordsworth's unconventional style was not well received until 1820, and he later became Poet Laureate. Of angels, Wordsworth wrote, What know we of the blessed above, but that they sing and that they love? Today, our knowledge of angels is as vague as Wordsworth's musings, but the Miracle Research Center team is learning more case by case. We live in a world of logic, a world based on reason and science. Everything can be explained. Rational minds step in and facts take over. But what happens when something occurs outside of this circle of rationality? What happens when logic and reason are faced with an everyday event that poses new questions? What we can't explain isn't necessarily miraculous, but it does beg the question that is the title of our show, Could It Be a Miracle? Hello, I'm Bob Evans, producer. And I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer. Here at the Miracle Research Center, we've come across a variety of angel encounters, miracle stories, and visitations between different levels of reality. And what we've discovered is that the miraculous can follow a pattern. There are encounters which happen through the image of a departed loved one. Encounters involving an unseen presence which guides someone to safety. And encounters involving merely a voice, a voice that provides life-saving advice or reassurance in times of need. And that is exactly the mode of interaction we will focus on in this program. In each of our stories, a voice from another realm intervenes and changes a life. Coming up, an earthquake provides the backdrop for an intervention that not only changes, but saves a life. A woman is stopped from entering a deadly environment after heeding some heavenly advice. A voice gives a young girl just enough warning to avoid a disastrous accident. A driver responds to a voice he hears and hurriedly pulls off the road, even though nothing is perceived to be wrong with his car. And in a historical miracle, voices prove the difference in the war between England and France. Our first miracle comes from an earlier episode of our show and from Michelle's trip to Chicago. Best-selling author Joan Wester Anderson told me this incredible story of a girl who was able to avoid a violent attacker with the help of a mysterious voice. There was a little girl named Katie who, probably 12 or 13 when this happened, uh, she owned a horse but she boarded it at a neighboring farm where her girlfriend lived. The two of them would ride a little bit in the morning, um, brush down the horses, give them something to eat, and then hop on the school bus, go to school, come back, ride a little bit more, and then Katie's dad would come on his way from work, pick Katie up at the farm, and take her home. So it was a perfect arrangement. I wish I didn't have to leave him every night. 
will live with me. I mean, you could ride him anytime you wanted. I'm sure your parents wouldn't mind. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, here, I gotta get him cleaned up before my dad comes to get me. All right. You know, someday I'm gonna live in a place like this, and Blaze, of course, will have his own celebrity stall. <laughs> and room service. Well, I better get back home. My mom hates when I'm late for supper. Everything gets cold. All right, I'll just feed him some hay before I leave. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye. Katie had a feeling that something wasn't quite right. Just one of those feelings in the air. And the feeling kept getting worse and worse. Katie, stay away from the barn. Do not go in there, Katie. As if there was some real danger around her. Where's your other half? Oh, she's eating supper. Katie, what's gotten into you? I don't know, Dad. Is Blaze okay? Oh, he's fine. I just don't feel safe here. <laughs> but this is practically your home away from home. Oh, Dad, can we just leave, please? Next day, her father drove her back to the barn, which was his practice to drop her there so the two girls could ride before school. But he became alarmed when he saw that there were police cars parked on the, the farm premises. Everything okay here, officer? It is now. Yesterday morning, we had a violent inmate escape from the mental institution, and he ended up here. Here? Yeah, he was hiding in the barn behind a stack of hay. Uh, he had a pitchfork uh, in case somebody got in his way. <laughs> My daughter was here alone in the barn yesterday. <laughs> you have a very lucky daughter, sir. Katie told me that she was struck by the fact that she was not afraid of this voice. But she did feel it was a voice she needed to obey. So if Katie's angel had not spoken to her, she would have gone into the loft and probably confronted this man. But instead, she was, she was saved from a horrible situation by the voice of an angel. It's interesting that the girl initially hesitated when she heard the voice. She didn't immediately heed the warning. I think any of us would at first question the intervention of a mysterious voice. It's human nature to second guess the unexplainable, even when we see it with our own eyes, or as in this case, hear it with our own ears. Coming up next, a man driving down the road makes a sudden decision to pull off based solely on a voice. When we come back. Welcome back. Our next story comes from Bob's interview with Brad Steiger. That's right, Michelle. In my conversations with Brad Steiger, 
he told me this story of a man who had to deal with one of life's more commonplace frustrations, car problem. This story is from our book, Angels Around the World, and it deals with the phenomenon, if you will, of the inner voice that warns. And it's a voice that we all should learn to listen to, whether we say it comes from our own higher self, comes from an angel, comes from God. We need to learn to listen to that inner voice. A.R., he's in California, and he's been invited to the home of an old college friend for dinner. So he's on a, the freeway, and then all of a sudden he hears that voice. Stop the car. says pull over and he listens and again it's quite polite but emphatic stop the car okay 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 I am gonna stop the car I'm pulling over I'm pulling over I'm pulling over here we go here we go we're going How you doing, pal? I don't know. Got a problem, huh? You know, I don't know. There's just something wrong with the car. Huh. Nice car. No warning lights, nothing like that? Nothing. Uh, why don't you start it up for me? All right. What do you think? You see anything? You want to give me a minute, buddy? I just got here. All right, all right, all right. Jeez. You heard any strange noises coming out the car or anything? No, nothing. Hasn't been giving you any trouble at all, huh? No, no nothing. You know, I just had a Don't tell me. There's something wrong with the car. Right, right. right. I got that. I got to tell you, pal, I can't find anything wrong with it. All the same, could you just go ahead and tow my car for me? It's going to cost you 65 bucks. That's no problem. It's your money. So the tow truck driver, I mean, what's it to him, you know, if this is, <laughs> he gets paid regardless, so he says, okay, get in the cab. You know, most people would get real mad if I told them I had to tow their car. And then you come along, hell, you insist I tow it. Like I said, there's something wrong with the car. Yeah. Well, if you're so smart, maybe you should try and become a mechanic. He cranks it up. They haven't gone but a few feet, and the transmission falls out of the car. I told you there was something wrong with the car. Now, not only would A.R. have been killed, quite likely, but it could have been a 10, 12 car pileup if he had continued to drive and that transmission had fallen out when he was going at a high rate of speed. So once again, as crazy as it seemed to A.R., and even crazier to the tow truck driver that a voice told him to pull over when ostensibly nothing was wrong with the car, that inner voice saved his life. And it's a lesson we can all profit from. We can all learn to listen to the inner voice, as I say, regardless of whether we think it comes from an angel, a higher self, or from God. But there is that inner knowing, that inner awareness that can save our lives.
I know that when I'm on the road, I probably wouldn't stop unless I had a very good reason. And in this case, A.R. Thompson had very little reason other than a mysterious voice. I have to wonder how many of us would defy logic and pull off the road. How many of us would listen to such a voice? According to our experts, angels interact with us in whatever way they believe will allow them to get their message across. In this case, a voice repeated three times was enough to convince A.R. Thompson to listen. And he is convinced that the voice he heard was his guardian angel. In our next story, a mother heeds a voice and it saves a life. Angels don't always speak in audible words. Sometimes children, when they're explaining an angel voice to me, they'll say, I'm not sure if it was an inside voice or an outside voice. And I know what they mean. It's, did we hear it with our ear or did we hear it with our heart? And when I say that to them, then they kind of, oh, yeah, that's what I meant. Well, you know, angel, the word angel means messenger. And so they bring their message in many different ways, that's true. Um, I would say they can appear as a very common person. I have heard stories of angels appearing as a janitor or a homeless man, or they might appear as a driver of another car on a road. They might appear as a law enforcement officer or somebody that we know that might appear to be someone that we love that has died and been gone for years. Um, but they also can come to us invisibly as well with um, just a sentence or a word that will give us the same message and the same effect. I think probably whatever is most effective is what they do. Welcome back. Our next story comes from Bob's interview with Karen Goldman. You'll remember Karen is the author of the book, Angel Encounters. She says angels have a number of different ways of interacting with us. In this story, a baby's life is at stake. This lady is Joanne. I know her because I knew one of her foster children. She takes in six, eight foster kids at a time. She's a really down-to-earth lady. Joanne, get up right now. Susan, Susan, honey, come on. Get up, come on, come with mommy. Where's Alex? I'm right here. 
waiting to hear from Caltech on the official magnitude of the morning earthquake. Oh, that was pretty scary, wasn't it, kids? Yeah. But we're all right now, aren't we? Huh? Why weren't you scared? Yeah. I just knew we'd be all right. You weren't scared either, were you? Just tell me what you need me to do. Love your children. Thank you. Thank you. She sees a glow pass through the house now and then. She knows that all the kids that are in her care are taken care of really well. And, um, you know, there's just a nice feeling about their whole life. She, and it's given her tremendous faith. She can't even tell the story without crying. She's really I'm sure many people would wonder why an angel would choose to intervene through only a voice. Why not a vision or a physical presence? These questions come up all the time as we examine cases here at the Research Center. Our experts tell us that angels intervene in whatever way allows them to deliver their message most effectively. In this particular case, perhaps a voice was the best way to reach the baby's mother. These are questions for which there are no definitive answers, but ones which do leave us asking, could it be a miracle? Coming up next, a woman is diverted from a dangerous situation with the help of another voice. Don't go away. Welcome back. Our next story is another one of our favorites that aired in an earlier episode, and it comes from Michelle's interview with Angel author Eileen Freeman. As editor of the Angel Watch newsletter and author of several Angel books, including Touch by Angels, Eileen receives countless letters from people anxious to share their experiences with the miraculous. But our next story comes from Eileen's personal file. She encountered what she believes was her guardian angel and its voice may have saved her life. Angels come into our sphere of reference because we need help in some way. They don't come to have a cup of tea. They're beings on a mission who have a purpose in what they do. Now, angels are not the only means by which we can receive help. God has an infinite number of ways of helping us along the path, most often through other loving human beings, things we read, pennies on the street, and certainly through angels. Seems like when angels come, oftentimes it's in subtle ways. They don't always come right out and introduce themselves. Remember that angels are neither divine nor human. And if you see them in that perspective, usually you can feel the brush of the angel's wing, speaking metaphorically, of course, in your daily life the intuition that you never expected, the guidance that came to you without knowing it, the hand extended that was a totally strange hand that disappeared. Very often those are the hallmarks of the angel's presence. I was in college in New York City at the time, and I was not thinking much about angels at that time. As anyone who's in college knows, there are a lot of things to distract you. I was very much involved in social action issues, political issues. who lived in a nearby apartment. 
Now in New York, if you're not walking with anybody and you feel a hand on your shoulder, you expect the worst. When I first felt the hand on my shoulder, I thought I had imagined it, but there really was nobody nearby. I couldn't believe that this was going to be another angelic visitation. So I started to go into the building thinking it was my imagination. And that's when the hand became very insistent, pulled me back off the step, and when I actually heard the voice. Now, I never saw the angel, but the voice was unmistakable. What do you want? It is not wise to go in there now. I recognized it immediately as my guardian angel. Now, don't ask me how. Very few people can give you rational explanations for this. It's a kind of spiritual connection that the individual knows. Well, I went across the street where there was a little church I knew would be open, just so I could think about that. After all, even though angels won't force you into anything, if they suggest that something is not a wise idea, you do well to heed it. I started to hear sirens. Well, you always hear sirens in New York, so I ignored them for a while, but they got louder and there were more of them and more insistent until I was curious. And I went outside the church and stood in front. And I went across the street, but one of the men in uniform fended me off and said, I'm sorry, you can't go in there now. You can't go in there. What happened? What's wrong? My friend lives here. He's expecting me. <laughs> you better go find a phone and call him because you cannot go in there. What happened? A young lady has just been murdered in the elevator. Oh my God. Now please, everyone, stand back. words, it was very likely that I would have been that person in the elevator. And it reminded me again of the angel that is always very close to each of us. In this case, I heeded the warning. That is a frightening story. But I have to ask the question. Sure, maybe the voice was that of Eileen's guardian angel, and she was saved from a possible attack. But where was the guardian angel of the woman who was killed by the psychopath? Eileen said that very question haunted her for some time until she did some research. She makes a point which several of our experts have agreed upon, that angels cannot interfere with a person's free will. So the woman who was killed may have had her guardian angel right there with her when she was killed, but the angel could not stop the killer's knife. Again, there is no concrete answer. This is the realm of the mysterious, and we are left to judge for ourselves on the basis of the facts presented here in this case. Coming up, a child is saved from a dangerous storm. With the help of an unseen guardian. Stay tuned for more miracles. I think that when people hear these heavenly voices, it's not like a person's voice. It's a voice. It's like the whole universe vibrating in your system. You know, you can't avoid hearing it. And that's actually how it feels when, you know, you have communication from saints or angels or any pure beings. It's, it's, you can feel it in your cells. I mean, it's so much a part of you because in that realm where angels and holy beings live, anyway, every, everything is one. You're just part of them. It's, it's not like we're all separate individuals and we all have separate identities. It's, it's a very unified, universe. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle. You know, Bob, being from the Midwest, one of the things I really miss is a good thunderstorm. 
there is no better way to fall asleep than listening to the rain after the thunder and lightning have come and gone. But those storms can sometimes be dangerous. You're exactly right. Thunderstorms can be very damaging and extremely dangerous and frightening to children, except to the girl in our next story. This is from my interview with Brad Steiger. He says there are times when intervention by a voice is the quickest way to save a life. This story from Angels Over Their Shoulders deals with a young woman who all of her life had heard an inner voice directing her toward one particular career choice. And it was a career choice that fit very well with her likes and dislikes ever since she was a child. She had always been fascinated with weather. The setting for this story takes place on a very <laughs> dark and stormy night, sort of the mystery story setting. Mom, did you look outside the sky before? When it was all purple and pink, it looked really cool. Weather scan predicted this storm four days ago. Weather what? The program on my computer. You know, the one that shows everything. Pressure changes and dew points. It can even tell when lightning's going to strike. Well, I could certainly use the rain. I love the way the air smells right before an electric storm. I think I'll take a walk. Uh, think again, young lady. Electrical storms can be dangerous. Uh, that's a word you'll find in your spell check. Well, you better get over this fear when I become a storm chaser. Let's compromise. Meteorologist. It's 10 o'clock. I know where this is going. Good night, Anne. Good night, Mom. She goes up to her bed, uh, but first, you know, she's sitting there kind of watching. She gets up and goes to the window every once in a while because she's still fascinated. It's very reluctant to get into bed and, and leave all this drama uh, behind her. Better than fireworks, huh? Well, I was thinking it sounded more like a rock concert. You're the expert. I'm leaving you this flashlight in case. Oh, just in case the power goes out? I know. Laugh now. You wouldn't be laughing in the dark. No, I like the dark. Go ahead, get into bed. It's only thunder, Mom. I can appreciate <laughs> that from a distance. <sighs> See you in the morning. Good night. So she eventually lies down in her bed. And she's still watching the pattern of the lightning flashes on the ceiling and on the walls. And she's testing the old theory of whether you can count the beats. Is it getting closer? Is it moving away? And eventually, uh, by focusing that way, she does fall asleep. But she has not slept very long when she hears another voice other than that career-orienting voice. And this voice is much more immediate, much more dramatic, much more emphatic. And the voice says, get out of bed. Get out of bed right now. And she heeds the voice. Get out of bed. Get out of bed right now. She would surely have been killed if she had remained in bed, but she listened to that voice, and that voice saved her life. Lightning strikes are so unpredictable. I've laid in bed and counted the time from a lightning flash until the thunder to try and track a storm. This warning voice must have been connected to the very fabric of nature, and so how can we consider it supernatural? This is another situation where we can speculate about the source of the voice and why not an appearance by an angelic being. Coming up next, a miracle that comes from the history books showing that voices have played a part in the miraculous through the ages when we come back. No less a personage than Socrates, uh, the great philosopher, the gadfly of the Athenian marketplace, felt that he was continually guided by a supernatural voice, which he felt was his guardian angel. In fact, Socrates came to so implicitly trust the accuracy of what the voice told him to do that at the end of his life, when he was condemned to die uh, by the Athenian authorities and he had a chance to escape his execution by fleeing the city, well, his voice told him not to go, to stay and drink the hemlock, and he did. 
When we talk about stories of people hearing voices from heaven, we would be remiss if we did not discuss probably the most famous case of all, Joan of Arc. We discussed this story in an earlier episode, and it's one of our favorites because it illustrates the similarity across time of supernatural encounters, in this case with only a vocal interaction. You may remember Joan of Arc helped the French fight the English through her dialogues with the divine. But in Joan's time, as today, people react with skepticism when the topic of hearing voices comes up. We've been conditioned in our culture to feel that uh, people who hear voices, spiritual voices, are schizophrenic. And while they're, you know, it's undoubtedly true that some cases of schizophrenia result in audible hallucinations, what I don't think has been appreciated until recently is the fact that large numbers of very healthy people mentally will hear spiritual voices from time to time that may very well be legitimate. In fact, there's a long history of this. Uh, Joan of Arc, uh, the peasant girl with no formal education and certainly no military training, overnight became the commander in chief of the French army, the Colin Powell of medieval France during the Hundred Years War. At this time, the English had taken over three quarters of France and they were drubbing the French generals. And Joan, would, again, with no education, a female in a highly sexist age, suddenly having so much power, managed to do something that the French generals had been unable to do for uh, decades, beat the English. Remember uh, in St. Joan, the inquisitors ask Joan of Arc whether she's heard the voice of God. She says, yes, I've heard the voice of God. And they say, well, how do you know it wasn't your imagination? Oh, it was my imagination, she says. Well, which is it, they say, is it your imagination or is it the voice of God? And she said, but that's one of the ways God speaks to me is through my imagination. I am more afraid of sinning by saying something that would displease my voices than I am of answering you. How did St. Michael appear to you? Was he clothed? Do you think God had nothing to dress him in? Did he have hair? Why would they cut it? If he spoke, how did he talk? Only with knowledge and reverence. And what did this archangel tell you? Does God have no words? How old was he? Years, age are not important. The here and now are. When the voice came to you, was there light? He was surrounded by brilliant light, unlike you and your ranks. There are four ways God speaks to me, she says, through my memory and through my sorrows and through my loneliness and through my imagination. I actually add other ways, through my joy. God speaks to me through my joy. Let's imagine for, for, for a second uh, um, a, a young girl, you know, 17 years old, watching MTV, you know, every day, uh, and when suddenly she starts hearing voice, voices telling her that she needs to go in Washington to the White House and to meet the, the president. So, um, by, with a series of unlikely coincidences, she's able to meet it to Washington without a penny or, or a dollar. She's, uh, she's always falling on the right people, you know, the right person and the right place and, and so forth. She uh, land in Washington. She met, she met the president while he was jogging around the White House. And not only that, but she's able to convince him and as uh, his advisor as well, to give her uh, a couple of uh, police squad to clean up the United States from uh, drug dealers. We're waiting for Venus team leader. We will be unavailable for 10 minutes. Old timer out. Have any of you guys ever worked with this girly before? She's a boss and a good boss. She's not a girly, so get that out of your head. She's got no training, she's got no experience. There are more narcotic arrests that stick in court and more drugs off the street because of her. What will the newspapers say when they find out she gets her inside information from talking with angels? She hears voices. Do you think you'll quit and give up your retirement rather than listen to me? Do you think you can challenge my voices? And all I want to do is bust some drug dealers. I need 
to score. I need to score big. Come on, man. I've got grams, eight balls, and quarters. You tell me what you want, and I've got more upstairs. It's fine, man. I just need something now. Let's go. Right. Come on. We can't unscrew the top of Joan's head to see if her claims were valid, that she was hearing the voices of saints and angels advising her, but we certainly know by looking at the external world that something extraordinary was happening. You have here the typical case of somebody really hearing you know, the voice of angels. And not only that, but thanks, thanks God, she was trialed and burned because as she was trial and burn, we have all the documents and all the interviews and everything which have been said at that time. So that's why today there is still almost 10,000 books written about Joan of Arc. Voices. People have been institutionalized for hearing voices. When is a voice a sign of schizophrenia and when is it divine? Will we ever know? We hope you've been given new insight into the relationship between the reception of voices and the world of the miraculous. We will continue to bring you stories of remarkable encounters, mysterious messages, and other unexplained phenomena. And after each story, ask yourself the same question we pose every week. Could it be a miracle? The events that you have just seen cannot be backed by rationale, and they do not lend themselves to interpretation. It is this very lack of explanation that prompts us each week to ask the inevitable. Could it be a miracle? <laughs>